So, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. And as you might already be aware, our theme this month is uh, epidemiology. And we have got some interesting live events that we have organized for you, which I'm sure you have been following through our announcements on social media. So our first live event this month is a um, talk slash Q&A session with Prof. Uh, David Schultz. So Professor Schultz is a um, obviously professor of meteorology at the University of Manchester and he's also the director of the Centre for Crisis Studies and Mitigation. So briefly, um, if we were to talk about David's background, so David has completed his education in USA and then he moved to Finland to continue his research and career interests. And currently his uh, primary research interests are in, uh, one of his uh, primary research interests uh, is in how the atmosphere works to create weather and climate. And obviously through his uh, outstanding work, he has been awarded various prestigious awards throughout his career. So this evening they will, will tell us about uh, one of his other research streams, which is um, looking into the potential links with weather and chronic pain. So before we start the session, I would like to remind our audience that you can submit your questions using the chat function on YouTube channel or through our social media accounts. And following the break, I will be asking these questions to David on your behalf. So David, again, thank you for agreeing to be with us this evening. And I look forward to your talk. So the stage is yours. Great, thank you so much. So I want to talk to you tonight about um, a project that we did called uh, with, with the clever name Cloudy with a Chance of Pain. And it involved citizen scientists to help us understand how weather affects pain. Now this is, uh, depending on, on your background and experience, may not be familiar to you, but three quarters of people who um, suffer with chronic pain believe that uh, the daily pain that they experience fluctuate with changes in the weather. And, and you know, my parents are, are among these. They both have arthritis and my mom says that she thinks that she can predict the weather based on the pain that she's experiencing. Now, this is not a new concept. Hippocrates uh, in ancient Greece recognized that this, uh, that, that moving to different climates, uh, different weather conditions could affect um, people's sense of well-being. Now, what was interesting about this work is, is that despite all this anecdotal evidence and large fraction of people who believe this uh, effect, that scientific support for these claims is, is not really um, there's not a lot of strong scientific support. And we can show this by um, reference to a review article that we wrote at the, around the same time that we were doing this study. And what we did in this um, review article was look at 43 articles that um, studied the relationship between um, people who experienced pain and uh, musculoskeletal pain and uh, the weather. And of these 43 articles that made it into our review, two thirds of them found at least one um, relationship that, that, they, that the study reported themselves between some weather variable and a, some measure of pain in, in the people participating in the study. So we might already get the sense that um, there might be a positive publication bias that people are only publishing um, results where they have positive, uh, at least one positive association between weather um, and pain. However, we also observed in, in these papers that people were, were quite clear that um, some of these relationships, although they, they may have been positive and maybe even statistically significant, um, were, were not of clinical significance. In other words, the differences were, were so small that, that people could not, that, that they wouldn't be useful in a, in a doctor's setting. Or they, the relationship 
may have made a minimal contribution to pain. These were exact quotes from these articles. Now, more importantly, the results of these studies, even when they seem to be in agreement, um, were contradictory in many respects. So for instance, they may have agreed that temperature, uh, there was a strong effect at temperature, but some found that cold was associated with more pain and others found that warmth was associated with more pain. Let's just take barometric pressure uh, as, as one measure, for instance. So this was the variable that was most included in, in these 43 articles. Then 20 of the studies reported no link between pressure and pain. 11 reported that high pressure or pressure that was increasing were associated with higher pain levels. And seven reported low or decreasing pressure were associated with higher pain levels. So you can see, you know, there's quite a bit of variability. So why, naturally, this raises the question of why there's so little consensus among the scientific studies in this context. And, and by far, at least one of the more obvious um, reasons is that these studies simply had small data sets. They may have been looking at a small number of um, participants, or they may not have lasted for a very long time. And this plot shows um, the 43 different studies that were in the duration of, of the study on, on the x-axis here. And you can see it goes from zero to over um, a, a year's worth of data. And then on the y-axis, we can see a, a nonlinear scale, a logarithmic scale, with fewer than uh, 100 people involved in the study and, and some over a million. And, and what's clear is you can either have um, a large number of people, in this case over a million, but they only looked at one day's worth of, of data. So they there was no um, follow-up between individual patients. On the other hand, they, you may have, um, you know, over a year's worth of data, say, but there were only 100 people in that study. So this is clearly a problem if you're trying to tease out subtle effects among very complicated data. But there are other things that limit our ability to reach consensus on these studies. The first one is, is simply not being exposed to a full range of, of weather conditions. As I mentioned, um, in some cases, there were as few as nine observation points per patient. And this may have been in the span of uh, two weeks or a month. And, and naturally, we wouldn't see the whole variety of uh, weather that we might experience if say living here in the UK. So that, that might raise issues about the representativeness of the study results. We also recognize that weather is not the dominant thing that affects people's pain. Certainly um, there are other things that, that are more important. And in fact, those things that are more important may actually be related to the weather in what we call a, a covariate sense. So for instance, if the weather is nice, this might put you in a good mood, which might lead to people reporting lower levels of pain. However, if the weather is nice, people may want to go outside, exercise, go for a walk, and that might uh, make their pain worse. And so we've got these competing effects that weather is tied up to, tied into these covariates, the things that affect people's pain to perhaps even a greater degree than the weather. Of course, we've got the issue that maybe the weather data in these studies was not coincident with the patients. We know that some of these studies um, reported on people who were bound up in, in the hospital and obviously not going outside. So they weren't being exposed to the outside weather conditions of temperature and, and humidity, say. Um, likewise, some of the statistical data on the weather was was not from the location where the people were. It, it may have been from some very remote location. And finally, another issue that relates coming to the 
consensus with these studies is that um, there's selective reporting of statistical tests, what scientists call p-hacking. So for instance, if, if we have as many as 342 associations and we find one relationship in there, we could say, oh yes, there was a relationship, but it may not be very powerful in terms of statistics. Um, so, so these are all reasons why these studies may not have reached consensus. Now, the, the bigger question, of course, is why is this important? Why do we need to understand this? And if there is a physical link between weather and pain, as, as these studies may, may suggest, then this might lead to designing future interventions or therapies that could help people even outside of the, the weather forecast uh, outside of, of the weather influence on their pain. But also, if if we can make predictions on what caused this pain, then we can start to think about delivering people um, individual pain forecasts to help them better manage their pain. And we know from talking with people who were involved in our study and other and elsewhere that this is something that, that they would um, like to have. So enter... Professor Will Dixon at the University of Manchester. He's a clinical rheumatologist. He's also a researcher. So he wears multiple hats, as I've indicated here. And he came up with the idea of Cloudy with a Chance of Pain, um, where what we did was link a smartphone app that people could access with um, use it, coupling that with the GPS signal to identify the location that, that people were at and hence get the closest weather observation to that point. And the idea was that if we could do this and have people report in a frequent um, way, then we might be able to collect the largest and perhaps even longest data collection effort ever to examine the relationship between weather and pain. Now, let me show you what the screen capture of, of the smartphone app looks like. It's got these different um, things called motifs uh, that look like petals from a flower. And the patient drags um, each one of these um, petals out to a different level on a scale of one to five. And you can see the 10 different things that they enter each day. And, and so people who participated in our study downloaded the app. They were sent a reminder in the evening to enter um, the, their reports each day. And you can see the kind of feedback that we got from people um, who were participating in the study. They were just loving it. We actually not only collected data from them, but we presented that data back to them so they could look for their own relationships between what they were doing and weather and pain. Um, and Another uh, woman thought it was very creative. And, um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we had such high engagement in this study. And I'll, I'll mention um, how many people participated in this study shortly. So let's just get to the results. What did we discover? Um, we've got several papers that, that we've been publishing based on this research. I'm going to talk about the one that, that I led and, and obviously was most directly um, involved in. It was published in uh, BAMS, which stands for the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. And it was the first paper to show the weather patterns associated with pain in chronic pain sufferers. And you can see the team there, the, the cloudy with a chance of pain team. Now, some definitions of, of what this study involved um, first, before I show you some results. What I did was look at the top and bottom 10% of all days in the study. And, and this was a study that ran for 15 months of collecting data. And uh, of these 15 months worth of data, we looked at the um, percentage of days uh, we, we looked at the number of people who were reporting a pain event that day, and I'll define what a pain event is shortly. And we looked at the, the top 10% of days where the most people were reporting uh, pain events and the bottom 10% of days 
look where people were reporting the 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 the, the, the fewest number of people were reporting pain events and and so typically the the bottom 10 percent of days amounted to about 10 percent of the people who were reporting on that day reporting a pain event the the top was about um 20 to 22 percent of people now a pain event we defined as a one or more category increase in pain from the preceding day and, and remember we were collecting measurements of um, self-reported pain by these people on a scale of one to five and and so that's um, this kind of 20 percent increase um, is consistent with other studies that show that um, that's about the level at which people can report um, self-report uh, uh, increase in pain and as I mentioned, we had quite a large number of people. We had 10,500 people participate, and, uh, and their data was eligible for um, my, my particular study here. So here are the first results. These are box plots that show um, the, the average, the, the line in the middle, what we call the interquartile range. So that's the middle 50% of data. And then um, these these whiskers uh, running away from from the box represent kind of the the range of other data points. And uh, what we did was we compared days with high number of people reporting pain, what we called high days, against low days. These were days where a low number of people were reporting pain. And so box plots can show you those distributions of quantities um, in a way that, that help us compare a large amount of data in a very concise format. So here we are looking at temperature, the box plot for days with a high number of people reporting pain events was their mean was around eight degrees Celsius, but on days there where a low number of people were reporting pain, the temperature was um, higher, in this case, about 10 degrees Celsius. Now, the dew point is a measure of the amount of moisture in the air. We, we measure it and we, we describe it in terms of temperature, but, but this would be a very dry day. So again, the high days tend to be a little bit drier, a little bit colder than um, low days where a low number of people are reporting. And the same thing is true with pressure. Um, pressure is lower on days where a high number of people are reporting pain and pressure is higher on days where a low number of people are reporting pain. The wind speed is, is a little higher um, on days with a high number of people reporting pain than it is to a lower number of people of pain. And relative humidity was not very different between these two. So these are the raw statistics that um, our analysis uh, throws out. Um, but of course, being a meteorologist, I love looking at weather maps. So let's look at the weather maps that are associated with um, high and low pain days. Now, so that we've got high days on the top and um, these solid lines represent, we can think of them as the jet stream when these lines are packed close together, that represents a strong wind blowing from west to east. The color here indicates anomalies from the average. So in this case, um, the jet stream is, is relatively straight across the United, uh, across the UK. And um, that's associated with days on which uh, a large number of people reporting um, pain. At the surface of the earth, we measure sea level pressure. And you can see here that there is anomalous low pressure located bullseye right over the UK. Again, consistent with what um, a large percentage of people tell us that lower pressure and the weather associated with lower pressure, more rain, lower temperatures, higher wind speeds are consistent with days in which they're experiencing pain. Now let's compare the high pain days with the low pain days. 
And here you can see the jet stream isn't straight. It's got this uh, bulge towards the north. We call that a ridge. And you can see there's anomalously high heights here, indicating the jet stream is pushed to the north, north of uh, Scotland. And this brings warmer air to the UK. And at the surface, this is associated with higher pressure and and you can see again the bullseye of high pressure anomalies right over the uk so summarizing that high days that are experienced that where people experience um, a large number of people experience pain are associated with lower pressure over the uk days where um, not a lot of people are experiencing a pain event associated with higher pressure and the weather associated with those um, over the UK. Now, we did a lot of public engagement. We had a press release with this paper. Um, coincidentally, uh, the, uh, someone in the Washington Post was writing an article about weather and pain and contacted me. And so we got a big spread in the, in the Washington Post. And I was on uh, the Weather Channel's um, Weather Geeks podcast at talking about my research. And, you know, besides the, the scientific results that I've just told you, we had two other main messages that we wanted to communicate. First, um, you know, there, as I mentioned, there have been a lot of other studies that have been published on this. And, and so people might reasonably ex expect that, um, you know, there might be some, um, uh, you know, people may not be interested in, in this or confuse it with other previous studies. And so we said, look, this is the largest study to date and gives us the greatest confidence in results. And moreover, um, it confirms this anecdotal evidence that people have that weather influences their pain. And this gives people who suffer from um, weather related uh, pain that it's not just in their heads. Then. Sometimes we, we hear stories about doctors who, who don't even believe that. And so, um, you know, those, those are kind of the uh, um, main messages that we tried to communicate. So what's next for the Cloudy with a, a Chance of Pain team? We've got uh, some research going on now about whether there are subgroups of people who are weather sensitive or not that, that may give us more power in terms of understanding the strength of these relationships. We also are asking the question, which is the weather variable responsible for pain? Because if we can understand that, then we can start to think about those therapies, as I mentioned before. We also want to get at the question because we have information about whether people were inside or outside most of the day, whether there's a difference between people who mostly stayed inside versus people who were outside most of the day. And as I alluded to, if, if we can pull all of this together and, and look at the numerous factors that we collected, in addition to just the weather, then we may be able to make personalized weather, um, not weather, <laughs> personalized pain forecasts for people. And so, so to, to summarize then uh, what we discovered, um, there's a lot of subtle effects here, as I as I mentioned at the start of the talk, and, and you need a long time, you need a large population in order to tease out these very subtle relationships. Um, so the idea was that coupling smartphone and engaged citizen science scientists could allow us to answer these questions on very large scales with data in a way that would have been difficult to do previously. I talked about how higher pain days are colder with um, lower dew points or, or drier days with lower pressure and, and higher winds and um, lower pain days are, are the opposite. Our study gives confidence to people who believe that weather influences their pain. And um, again, the publication of results in the media engagement showed that even when we made clear why we um, did the study, there were still some people who kind of missed the, the point. And that, that's kind of the problem ultimately with sound bite science, you know, just looking at these kind of age old questions with um, simple answers. And so that's the end of my talk. I hope you find that useful. If you have any questions, um, I'll, I'll hand it over to our moderator and, and see if there are any. Thank you.
Lovely. Thanks very much for this interesting talk, David. It is actually quite nice to hear this because, like you say, you always hear either your parents or grandparents talking about these things. And uh, now I think we can be sure that they're telling the uh, truth. It's not just in their heads. So um, I would like to give a five minute break. And then once we resume, we will go over the questions, if that's all right with you. Hello again, thanks for staying with us during the break. So, uh, David, it was really interesting to find out about your um, research findings, research, recent research findings. So, um, the first question that I would like is, I would like to ask is, what challenges did you face when completing this research? Yeah, certainly there were a large number of, of challenges that we faced. One is that we were trying to analyze data in, in a way that, that maybe hadn't been done before. Many of the other studies used very simple approaches like um, linear regression, you know, fitting a straight line um, between the data. And, and um, it wasn't clear that this was necessarily the best way to, to do it. And so we had a lot of discussions throughout the analysis and, and continue to have discussions about the best way to analyze the data. One of the issues that comes up, as I mentioned, is are these um, covariates, these things that depend upon each other, like being outside, like um, level of physical activity and how to account for that so that um, our results um, don't don't conflate, don't have all these competing effects um, messing up the results is is certainly a challenge. And uh, and then finally, one of the challenges is that that, um, you know, getting funding, you know, people to, you know, being able to hire people to, to do the analysis with technical expertise has is, is always been a challenge. It was, uh, you know, we, we were able to pull off the, the study, but but um, due to the generosity of our funding agencies, but but we, we, we have been more, dif it's been more difficult to get funding to continue this work. Okay, okay, great, thank you. So um, I was also wondering, you know, you talked about citizen scientists. So can you tell us about you know exactly what do you mean by that and about the role and importance of actually uh, the citizen scientists so so citizen science it's kind of a well a new term within the last 10 10 years or so at least that i'm familiar with and the idea is that um people you know lay people who are interested in science can contribute to the making of science and i think this example our cloudy with a chance of pain study is a really nice example of that because we needed a large number of people who suffered from chronic pain and you know wanted to participate um to, to find the answer to this problem with us and it wasn't just as simple as filling out a survey that takes five or ten minutes this was a dedicated effort from 10,000 people over a large period of time, 15 months. Now, of course, not everyone entered their data every day, but enough people entered their data uh, of these 10,000 people that we were able to use their data in the analysis that I presented today. And as I mentioned, their data will continue to support other projects that can arise from this data. Um, and they were involved throughout the process too. So not only were they were participating by entering data, but as I mentioned, the app had the ability for them to contribute to the hypotheses um, that we were trying to develop by looking at, at their own personal um, data collection and the things that they thought they saw in the data that influenced their pain. Okay. Uh, one of the other things that I'm wondering, though, you mentioned that um, not everyone has filled the data every day. So presumably, 
if I were one of those people doing this uh, exercise, I would have probably remembered to enter the data on the days that I'm feeling the pain. So what kind of approaches did you actually um, adopt to overcome that bias? That's right. A lot of these um, studies, well, you can think about it from your own experience, right? You download an app. How many times do you look at that app after you've downloaded it? You know, maybe a few times and, and then, you, you know, it, it just gets buried and you never use it again unless it's something that's really essential and you find extremely useful. So this was obviously one of the problems that we had to deal with was getting people to engage on a regular basis. And so we had during the project a public engagement person whose job was to keep people actively engaged. Mm -hmm. We had a, a weekly newsletter that told stories that, um, you know, introduced the scientists, talked about the problems that we were trying to solve, gave them resources, talked about the people who were participating and why they were participating. The app itself, every evening, as I mentioned, send a no sent a notification to the person so that they could be reminded um, to enter their, their daily report. But even still, um, depending on the type of analysis technique that we used, um, we could use incomplete records. We didn't need, uh, like I said, for some types of analysis techniques, we didn't need a continuous record of data. And, and my study um, was, was one of them. As I mentioned, we were able to use the full complement of 10,000 people who entered data, whereas there are other types of analysis techniques where we needed more regularly spaced um, data entry from people over, uh, over a period of time. And that limited uh, the number of people whose data could contribute to the study, sometimes down as, as low as only 2,000 people um, data made it into that study. Again, because of the criteria that, that the analysis approach imposed on, on the, you know, the, the form of the data and, and how frequent it needed to be. Okay. okay, great. So um, my other question, the last question then is, um, are there any theories about how the weather could influence pain? Yeah, I, I, I'm not an anatomist, so <laughs> I, 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 I shouldn't speak too much to this, but um, naturally joints um, can be quite sensitive to pain. We know people obviously heat and, and cool their joints you know, after exercise or whatever, you know, warm them up beforehand, cool them down afterwards, and that can help relieve pain. So, you know, just the pure temperature sensation against um, people's joints and muscles may make um, a difference. Um, of course, the, the sacs of fluid that are in the joints are under pressure and it's been speculated again i'm not uh, <laughs> i can't comment on the quality of that speculation but it's been speculated that um you know the pressure inside those sacs might be sensitive to the external pressure um and then of course we know that humidity is a great indicator of people's comfort I'm not quite sure how that relates to um you know people's pain but we certainly know that when the dew point temperature rises, when it, when, it, when it feels more muggy or humid outside, you know, if there's no air conditioning, people certainly experience more sluggishness and so forth, whether that influences people's pain through, you know, who, who have chronic pain, I, I don't know. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for your time and your effort into this. And uh, I think this is the end of our questions. I'm just checking the um, chat function here. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot, David. It was a pleasure having you with us this evening. Um, and it was definitely an interesting talk. Thank you very much for the invitation. I hope everyone enjoyed the talk. I'm sure. I'm sure. Take care.